I have a problem, and I'm willing to come clean about it this morning. I'm addicted to a certain type of food, and I'll be honest with you, I'm having a hard time controlling this addiction. It's not a healthy food. I guess if it were, I wouldn't feel the need to bare my soul this morning. I've tried to lessen its effect over my life, but so far, I haven't been too successful. The food is this. Anybody else like chocolate mini donuts? Yeah, thank you. So they come in a sleeve of six, but some genius at Miss Baird said, you know, if six are good, eight would be even better, and that person deserves a life-changing raise. (laughs) Not long ago, I went into Stripes to pick up a few items. I walked down the aisle that contained the chocolate mini donuts, determined that I wasn't going to get any, but I could hear them crying out to me. I had the angel on each shoulder, one telling me, come on, Chris, it's not going to hurt anything if you eat eight. You know, just get one. Indulge yourself a little bit. You've been good. Of course, then the other angel is saying, ah, you haven't been that good. It's not like you eat real healthy all the time anyway. And I'm saying this in front of my cardiologist. I can't believe I'm doing this, coming clean this morning. And so I did my best to avoid the temptation, but uh, unfortunately, I I didn't succeed that morning. Um, I grabbed some chocolate mini donuts. I paid for them, and I ate them in the car real fast before I got home. (laughs) I was unsuccessful in the fight that day. Temptation one, you know, I like to fish. Maybe that's an addiction too. And one thing that I know about fishing is you're only going to be as successful as the bait you use, right? And so when you're trying to catch fish, there are certain fish that eat certain types of bait. So if you're fishing for crappie, minnows, jigs, something like that, bass, maybe a topwater bait. Last year, they really liked a green pumpkin worm. Maybe they'll do that this year too. Um, Catfish, anything that stinks, right? So you got to know what kind of bait to put on the hook. You dangle it in front of them and hopefully they bite. Satan is a master fisherman. He knows exactly what type of bait to put on the hook in order to entice you to take a bite. And we need to know that about our opponent. We talked about this over the last few weeks, is we need to know our opponent, his strategies, his tactics, what he does in order to win us. But not only do we need to know something about our opponent, we need to know something about us as well. It's not enough just to know something about the enemy. you got to know yourself, your weaknesses, where you're most vulnerable. What are the things that entice you? Put yourself in the devil's shoes. What would you use to entice you? This morning, we continue our series on spiritual warfare by looking at the age of overlap. That is the age we are living in right now, the age of overlap. There are two kingdoms, and we are living with one foot in each of them. These two kingdoms are ruled by two different fathers, Satan and God. And so the question becomes, who's your father? Modern terms, who's your daddy, right? You ever expected one thing and then got something completely different? I'm sure we've all been in that boat. This kid has certainly been in that boat. This young man begged and begged his mother to let him eat Hershey's cocoa straight out of the container. And his mother tried to warn him that you don't want to do that. That while Hershey's cocoa tastes really good mixed in milk, it's pretty bitter when you eat it by itself. Yet the boy continued to nag his mom about letting him eat it out of the container. And so she, in order to teach him a lesson, allowed him to do so. And that was the result. We've all had a situation maybe where we expected one thing and got something else. We anticipated something, but what we got was very different. We've talked about this before, but in essence, the Jews expected a kingdom in the line of David. They expected a king who would bring peace and prosperity. One who would be just like the other kings that came before, earthly in nature. 
And in their minds, God would anoint a strong leader, a valiant warrior perhaps, who would overthrow Caesar and anyone else who opposed him and his people. And of course, since the king would sit on an earthly throne, his rule and reign would be carnal in nature. He would institute the law of Moses for everyone to follow, and everyone would bow down to Yahweh. The Jews never lost conviction that they were indeed God's chosen people. Their history had been riddled with disaster, but they always held out hope that God would intervene. And so they waited and they waited. And when their king finally arrived, they didn't want him. They wanted a warrior king. But what they got was a good shepherd. Now, the prophets of old spoke about the coming kingdom. The minor prophets had much to say about the kingdom that was to come. Micah, for instance, stated that it would be a kingdom made up of the remnant of the tribes of Israel and from people from every nation on earth. Isaiah spoke about the king whom God would anoint to reign over his kingdom, and that, of course, was Jesus, the Messiah. The anointed one would bring about an eternal era of peace and prosperity as he ruled and reigned. So, when Jesus arrived on the scene, he came announcing the kingdom of God that the prophets had spoken of, that they had foretold, and he did so primarily in parables. His favorite topic to teach on was kingdom. The Jewish people knew all that the prophets had foretold, all that they had spoken of. They knew about the kingdom, but their version of this kingdom was very different. They anticipated one thing, but what they got was fairly different, we could say, in the least. When Jesus came speaking about a spiritual kingdom in which the deliverer would be killed by the enemies rather than killing the enemies, it was confusing to say the least. So when we read Jesus' teaching on the kingdom, we must do so in the context of what the Jews expected or anticipated. Just consider the parables of Matthew chapter 13. All the parables in Matthew chapter 13 have to do with the kingdom. So you have the sower and the seed, right? Which talks about the heart or the soil that is able to receive the word, able to receive the teaching on the kingdom and how to stay faithful to the king. You have the teaching about the wheat and the tares. So the sons of evil and the sons of the kingdom will grow up alongside one another until the end of the age. And then you have the teaching about the leaven and the mustard seed. Here Jesus is teaching that the kingdom isn't going to come to fruition just in one failed swoop, that it will come about slowly and gradually until it fills the whole earth. And then finally you have the parable of the treasure and the pearl, talking about how this this kingdom is so, so valuable that it's worth giving up everything you possess just to own it. And then if you look at the end of Matthew chapter 13, you read these words, therefore, Every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So if one is going to comprehend the teaching of the kingdom, you have to take the old, the treasures of old, what the prophet spoke of, and combine it with the new treasures that Jesus spoke of. And was revealing. So the anticipated Messiah had arrived. The one that the prophets had spoken of and pointed to was now standing in their midst, which also meant that the kingdom had arrived as well. But it was kind of like a box of chocolates. Any of you ever get chocolates on Valentine's Day? Ladies, probably. If you know anything about that box of chocolates, you know that it's a gamble, right? It's a risk. You pick up one of those pieces of chocolate that looks so good and you bite into it and you get some gross juice that flows out, like the cherry filling. That's disgusting in my opinion. So what do you do if you get one of those? What do you do if you pick up one of those chocolates and you bite into it and it's not toffee or caramel? What do you do? You put it back, right? I mean, that's what I do. You expect one thing, you anticipate one thing and you bite into it and you get something very different. That is the story of the Jews. They expected one thing, but what they got was something completely different, and they didn't like it. They were disappointed. They were even angry because Jesus was not what they were expecting. His kingdom wasn't what they were anticipating, and so they were content to just put him back in the box. They didn't want any part of him. They didn't want any part of a king who got killed by the others. They wanted a king who would rule with an iron fist and to be part of this kingdom meant taking up your cross and following in Jesus' footsteps. And that wasn't a a, a very um, endearing proposition either. 
Other kingdoms are established by war and conquering other nations. God's kingdom would be established through meekness and self-sacrifice. Wasn't all that appealing. But here's something else concerning Israel's expectation. The Jews tended to believe that when one age ended, the other age began. And that's totally reasonable and logical. When one era would begin, it would only begin because another era had stopped. So when the Messiah came, the age of sin and death and government persecution and the rule and reign of evil would end at the same time that the age of the Messiah began. And there's nothing unnatural about that at all. If we were living in that day and time, that's exactly the way we would think. The Messiah comes, he establishes his kingdom, he rules and he reigns, and therefore evil is done away with, it's overthrown, it's abolished. But Jesus seems to say throughout many of his parables that there's actually going to be an overlap, that the two are going to run together. Look with me at Matthew chapter 13. And again, Matthew 13 is all about kingdom teaching. Right after Jesus gives the parable of the sower, a parable that speaks about the heart or the soil that is able to receive the teaching and be faithful, Jesus then says these words. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seed or weeds among the wheat and left. And when the wheat sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also became evident. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. While you are gathering up the weeds, you might uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So, what Jesus is talking about here describes the age that you and I are currently living in. For the last 2,000 years or so, we've been living in the age of overlap. The kingdom has come, it has been set in motion, but it hasn't reached its complete and total fulfillment. And the reason why I can say all that with confidence is because I can look around me. And you can too. Just look around. Evil hasn't been abolished. Or immorality still persists. There's still corruption. There's still injustice. The devil is still at work. There are still enemies of God. Satan is alive and well and doing his best to oppose kingdom things and kingdom citizens. Look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man death came, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. after that, those who are Christ in his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to our God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is clear that this excludes the Father who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Jesus has, is, and will bring about his kingdom. And the great priestly king, Jesus, is bringing God to the people By fully revealing God to us. That is what it means that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is showing us what God looks like. And he is bringing us to God by taking away our sins. That's why he came to this earth. To seek and save the lost. To reveal God to us. And to bring us closer to uh, uh, to God as our mediator. Right? He is our mediator. He reigns and rules as mediator. Bringing grace and mercy and forgiveness. This is the reign of the Son of Man. Jesus is the one through whom the Father currently reigns. He is the one, as Isaiah prophesied, that is to bring good news to the poor, 
to build up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open to the prison those who are bound. He is the one who came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all those who mourn. That's Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Father will not always rule through a mediator. One day all evil will be vanquished. So you won't need a mediator because there's no evil. There's no sin. Therefore, you don't need a mediator any longer. And Paul alludes to this in in verse 24. He says, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Evildoers are going to face judgment. We know how this whole thing ends, right? The sons and daughters of the kingdom will enjoy the rule and reign of God forever and ever. God will no longer rule through a mediator. He will rule through himself, uncontested. Jesus' mission of uniting God with humanity will have been fulfilled. No more evil, no more mediator. Satan will be no more, and thus evil will be no more, and therefore humanity will no longer need that mediator. Jesus will still reign, but we all will reign with him. We'll be glorified to reign with him. That's Romans 8, 17, 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. The Father will finally be with the redeemed and the royal family will be complete. And as chapter 13 of Matthew states, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. What a beautiful picture that we have to look forward to as kingdom citizens. But you can understand why why Jesus' audience, why why Paul's audience, while even today, some might be confused. So has the kingdom come, or is it coming? Did the resurrection change everything, or not? The answer is yes. Yes. That is precisely the message of the parable of the wheat and the tares. The kingdom has come. And yet there are still weeds. What's up with that, right? I thought the fact that the kingdom had come meant that the weeds go away. One era stops as a new era begins. That's how it's supposed to work, right? That's what the Jews thought. So who planted the weeds? Why are there weeds growing with the wheat? Jesus didn't plant the weeds. They were planted by a different sower who also has a kingdom. Well, then surely, Jesus, you're going to uproot them, right? Surely you're going to rid the field of weeds. You're going to get rid of all the bad stuff and the sower that planted them, right? You're going to get rid of all the bad stuff. And again, that's a logical, reasonable way to think. Yet Jesus says not so fast. Because if you uproot the weeds, you're going to take some wheat with it. That's the tension that we deal with that's the rub that we feel has the kingdom come or not did the resurrection change anything or not if the kingdom has come then why is there so much brokenness in the world if the king reigns then why is there so much death and sin i mean it's the primary argument for the atheist if there is a god then why is there so much suffering in the world jesus why don't you pull the weeds why don't you do something about it and jesus says in essence Not yet. Now is not the time. Because if I pull up the weeds, I'm going to uproot some of the wheat. Let me ask you this. At what point in history would you have wanted God to do away with all evil? Think about that. At what point in history would you have wanted God to abolish all evil? For me, any time after October 1997. Because that's when I was baptized. I want you to do away with evil before that. You know why? Because I wasn't a Christian. You see, the Jews wanted Jesus to do something about the weeds. And thankfully he didn't. You know why? Because they would have been in trouble. There's no one righteous, not even one. So Jesus is waiting. God is waiting. You don't want to abolish all evil just yet if you're not a Christian, right? Or if your neighbor that you've been working with is not a Christian, or, or that family member that you've been working with and trying to bring them to Christ, do you necessarily want God to do away with all evil now? It's a good thing that he's waiting, right? It's a good thing that he hadn't uprooted all the weeds. You see, he allows the evil to grow alongside the wheat until the end of the age because he's waiting. 
He's waiting for more wheat to grow, and he's waiting for you and me. You know what we do while we wait? We work because the harvest is plentiful. In the meantime, we work and we wait because God's delay means salvation. It means grace. Remember the words of Peter. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repent, repentance. We cry out, why God? Why is there so much evil in the world? Why don't you do something about it? And in essence, God has. He has done something about it. He is doing something about it. He will do more about it. Evil does not win. We know how this whole thing turns out. Evil will be defeated. Everything that is wrong will be made right. God wins. But the divine gardener is not ready to pull up the weeds. Not yet. Now is not the time. He's waiting. If we had our way, we'd either have a a barren field or a field full of weeds. We don't like to wait. We're impatient. But this is the age of patience. We might expect something different, like the Jews. But God's way is still the best way. Now, as we kind of wrap this up, I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter 9. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, we read these words. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Ephiah, son of a, a Benjamite, a valiant, mighty man. He had a son whose name was Saul, a young and handsome man, and there was not a more handsome man than he among the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. And you think, okay, Chris, well, why this random piece of Scripture? Why are you pulling this out now? Well, because it's really not random at all when you consider the context of what we're talking about this morning, especially when you're talking about kings and kingdoms. If you go back to Samuel chapter uh, 8, and verse 1 of 1 Samuel, we read about Israel demanding a king. They had the best king. They had the best king that anyone could ever hope for in God, but they wanted to be like the surrounding nations. And God tells them that's not a good idea, but they keep begging and he eventually relents and gives them what they want. Saul is the king that they had hoped for. But here's the deal with Saul. He was good on the outside, bad on the inside. He was brave on the outside, cowardly on the inside. Like a lot of rulers and reigners in in our world, maybe some good qualities on the outside, but not so good on the inside. Saul was a man's man, tall, dark, and handsome, great on the outside, bad on the inside. Then you have David's kingdom. When did David's kingdom start? As Saul's ended? No. You would think that would be the case. David had already been anointed king, so you would think Saul's out, David's in. But that's not how it happened. Saul was still on the throne, and he was pursuing David, trying to kill him, because David was a threat to the throne. And at one point, Saul is hot on the heels of David, and Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, and David has a golden opportunity to ambush him and kill him. But he doesn't. Because he was God's anointed. If Saul was not to be on the throne anymore, that was God's business, not David's. Notice what David says. Far be it from me, because of the Lord, that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. Saul was still king. And that meant something to David. David, in humble submission to God's anointed, cared more about that than than revenge. For David, rebellion against Saul was rebellion against God. In David's mind and heart, he believed that the Lord put Saul in that position, and if the Lord didn't want Saul in that position anymore, then he would remove him. But that wasn't David's responsibility. David's only responsibility was to submit, plain and simple. Who does that sound like? Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? The Messiah who was to come. David had many Christ-like qualities, and as we've talked about over and over again, you will find many characters throughout the Old Testament that display many great characteristics that are Christ-like, but they're only foreshadowing because they're not the perfect Messiah. David was a Messiah. Remember, Messiah just means anointed one. David was a Messiah. He wasn't the Messiah, the anointed one, 
but he is foreshadowing to the one who was to come. He gives us a preview of what God reigning over the earth through a man might look like. Now Saul, on the other hand, was representative of a man-ruled kingdom. And while there were some good kings sprinkled throughout the history of Israel and Judah, the vast majority were unjust, immoral, and corrupt. And that's really been our experience as well, right? I don't want to get too deep into politics, but for the most part, in our country, in our world, we have seen that when man rules, you get a lot of corruption, you get a lot of injustice, you get a lot of immorality. But Saul's kingship and kingdom represents Satan's rule and reign that stands in opposition to Jesus' will, whereas the kingship and the kingdom of David is foreshadowing to Jesus' rule and reign. And in fact, Jesus' king and kingship was prophesied to come through the line of who? David, right? See how all this comes together? We live in Satan's kingdom and Jesus' kingdom. We live in the age of overlap. Satan is king, Jesus is king. For now, we live in the age of overlap. Some cry out and say, why is there so much evil in the world? I'll tell you why, because Satan is still ruling and reigning. But at the same time, we could say, why is there so much good in the world? Well, I can tell you, because Jesus is ruling and reigning. And for a time, the wheat and the tares are going to grow up together. For a time, there is going to be an overlap in these kingdoms. We're going to live in that age, the age of overlap, the age of patience. But we live in the overlap with anticipation and hope because we know how this whole thing ends. The resurrection did change everything. In fact, this overlap and anticipation of hope comes for good reason because we are anchored to one who cannot lie and who has promised us that this life is going somewhere. The kingdom has come. It is here. There's still more to come. And one day the weeds will be removed. The wheat will be harvested. But until that day, we wait and we work. There was a young man whose dad owned a very lucrative construction company. And the young man decided to earn a little money one summer. He was going to work for his dad's construction company. He didn't work directly under his dad, he worked under a foreman, and it was a new foreman. And this new foreman had no idea that one of his workers was the boss's son. So one day the new foreman gathers up all his workers and says it's lunchtime, and they go into a trailer to eat lunch, and about that time the boss, the man's father, drives up. The foreman looks out the window and sees the boss pull up, and he rolls his eyes, and he says, oh great, Mr. Big is here. And the son, knowing exactly who he's talking about, Asked him, so who's Mr. Big? And the foreman said, the boss man, he thinks he runs this place, but I'm in charge. And about that time, the father, the owner of the business, peeks in the door and he says, hey son, you want to go to lunch? And the son says, yeah dad, I'd love to. And about that time, the blood leaves the foreman's face. And the young man gathers up all his stuff and about to walk out the door, he turns and he looks at the foreman and he says, I don't call him Mr. Big. I call him Dad. And all this you see, he owns it. He's running this place. Satan may think he's in charge, you know what? And although Jesus calls him a father, the father of lies, he's not our father. You know who our father is? The one who owns all this. The one who's running this place. Can we help you this morning? You need prayers? Would you like to study the Bible with someone? Want to talk about the next step in faith? Maybe you're ready to put on Christ in baptism. I don't know where you're at this morning, but we've been saying this throughout this series, that there is no good reason to leave here a loser. We know how this whole thing plays out. We know who wins. So get in and fight. And if we can help you, why don't you come as we stand, as we sing.